This is the first video on predictive control with constraints. Why are constraints important then? Well, a key weakness of classical linear control strategies are that they do not take account of constraints. And the problem is that a failure to take account of constraints can lead to disaster. And we're going to demonstrate that with a few simple examples in this introduction. One main reason for the success of predictive control is its ability to deal with constraints in a systematic fashion, as opposed to a more ad hoc fashion, as may occur with traditional PID. So, having shown the need in this introduction, the videos in this chapter will look at how predictive control incorporates constraints into the control design. So what are constraints? Well, most systems only exist within a specified domain. And if you go beyond this domain, you can get highly undesirable behaviors. So a simple example, as you can see, for example, with this snowman, if a system is too hot, then the components can fail, they can melt, they can operate imperfectly, and so on. So clearly, you need a constraint that the temperatures stay within certain bounds. <coughs> if a pressure is too high, then a safety valve may release, and that could lose you lots and lots of money's worth of valuable steam or something else. A valve can only move between 0% and 100% open. So if your control law is asking for a negative percent or something beyond 100%, clearly it's asking for nonsense. Real physical movement is going to be restricted by walls and other obstacles, so there's no point having a control law which assumes that you can go beyond that. Systems can only move so fast due to limits in power, energy, grip, and so on. And of course, you could come up with a whole number of other constraints yourself. The key thing is that you see constraints are real, they're important, and you cannot ignore them. So here's a simple example of why ignoring constraints may be bad. We're well, going to use a simple example of driving a car. You may not have a racing car quite like this, but just for illustration. So your aim is to get from A to B as fast as possible. Now a simple solution would be to accelerate to top speed and maintain that speed for the entire duration of the journey and that would get you there as fast as possible and that is what you would decide in an unconstrained problem. However, this strategy is going to fail. Why is it going to fail? Well, in general, cars cannot corner at top speed and any attempts to do so will result in a crash. There are also other practical concerns when you're on a real road, such as other road users, the rules of the road, and so on. So the key thing here is the solution you get from an unconstrained optimization, which says just go at top speed, is clearly not feasible. You cannot implement it, and therefore it's meaningless. We're going to do, show a simple example here with PI control of a tank level system. So our aim is to get the level in the tank to a specified depth, but obviously we don't want to overflow because that will give wastage and pollution and other things, and we also don't want to exceed the maximum level inflow which is due to the size of valves and the like. Let's assume that the maximum inflow is 2, and we're going to assess a particular PI control law. So there's the PI parameters I'm going to choose, proportional of 2 and I of 0.8. And we've got a little uh, MATLAB simulation that you can run here to see how this works. So let's go to the simulation. We'll just find the MATLAB window. <coughs> there it is. So there's the name of our file. If we run it, <coughs> and you'll see what you get is you get this nice little GUI here, which is the GUI of a tank. And what we're going to do now is we're going to enter what we said, proportional of 2. The integral grain we said put in 0 0.8. We want to run closed loop control. And now let's run it. And be careful. What I want you to do is watch things like the inflow, see what happens here, and watch things like have you got any overflow. Now, I guess what you will have noticed there is clearly the inflow um, spilt and caused a few problems. We didn't actually overflow the tank, but if I was to here put the target depth at something like 1.2, which is a bit nearer the top of the tank, and then run, 
and then you see we're also going to overflow the tank as well. So there are problems here just implementing a simple PI compensator. So let's close this and we'll go back to our MATLAB file. OK, so if we look at this file here, you can see what some of the problems are in simple terms. The flow is larger than that we allowed. We said the maximum inflow was 2, and this PI compensator took us to an inflow all the way up to 4, which is just not allowed and therefore it's meaningless. Also, we found that the tank could overflow, and that of course causes spillage with the consequent problems that go with it. So that's a simple example of running an unconstrained PI where there actually are constraints in the system. And by ignoring those constraints, we cause ourselves problems. So this is just reiterating the main issues. The control law exceeded the maximum input, and therefore it proposed values that cannot be implemented. And therefore, the implied linear relationships in your feedback law are no longer valid because the input is going to saturate. Similarly, if the tank overflows, the implied saturation means any loop analysis that you've done is no longer valid. And you might then ask, well, what would happen if constraints could be enforced? So let's look now at this concept of integral wind-up. It's a well-known problem with a poorly tuned and poorly coded PI compensator. You can get this thing called integral wind-up. In simple terms, the integral may still keep increasing even though the input has saturated and you can't actually increase the input anymore. And typically this might happen when the integral gain is too large. And the problem with this is that when the error reverses sign and therefore you expect the input to change direction, actually in the first instance you will see no change in the input signal at all because the integral term has got so large that it has to first wind down again before you can change sign. You'll see that in a minute with the simulations. The impact on control is self-evident. There's a loss of control as the feedback is essentially disabled. Changes in error in your summing junction actually have no impact on the control law because of this integral wind-up. So we've got a simple example here to demonstrate the problem. It's in chat 5, sim 1. So let's go here and we'll find that particular file so you can see it. Here it is. And you'll notice in this file, first of all, we simulate something called chat 5 exam 1, which has got integral wind-up, and then chat 5 exam 1b, which does not have integral wind-up. And if you want to see the corresponding simulink files, there they are. And you'll see this one here, they look the same. You'll notice you can't see much obvious difference. But if you go into the settings, you find this one's just a simple PID. And this one down here is a PID which actually has integral desaturation to stop things um, overloading. So what I'm going to do, rather than running those, you can do that yourself. I'm just going to go straight to the results, which are plotted here. So this is what happens if you don't take account of the limits on the input. So you'll notice here's the limit on the input. The input can't go below 1. But what's the output of the PI compensator? Can you see it's here? The PI compensator is giving you a signal which is well above the limit that you can actually implement. Now, where's the big problem here? What I want you to do is look at this particular time instant here. And you'll see the error goes from being negative to positive. And so what would you expect to happen? You would say, well, OK, to the left, the output's too small. I expect the input to be large or to be increasing. However, once I go past time t equals 2, the error has changed sign. And so realistically, I would be expecting the input to change value. But what input have you actually got? Well, the input you can implement is this black line I'm plotting. And what do you notice? It's saturated because you can't actually implement anything bigger. And when the error changes sign, the input stays saturated. So you really want it to come down. That's what you want, but that's not what's happening because the input coming out of the PI is all the way up here. So when you start integrating this other error, it takes a long time before you get back down to the saturated value and the input can actually reduce. And so the consequence of that is the output slower to converge 
than if the control law knew about this saturation. Now clearly people do know how to do integral desaturation and this is what happens if your PI compensator knows that you have saturated and here if you look carefully you'll see that the input coming out of the PI never goes above the limit of 1 <coughs> and when the error changes sign immediately the input starts coming down so you get nice neat convergence which is much much better than you had in this figure over here. So with integral desaturation the performance is much better. Now here's another example you may have thought about yourself. It's a bit like a segue. So what we've got is an inverted pendulum which has basically you're balanced on some sort of pinion here which can move along the bar so you can move this to the left and to the right. And Now your job is to actually move to a position somewhere like this. So what are you going to do if you want to move to a position like that? So in essence the way you do it is first of all you move slightly to the left because by moving slightly to the left you're going to tip the pendulum slightly to the right and then you'll be able to move to the right taking the pendulum thing with you. When you get past or round about your target point you actually need to accelerate slightly in order to get to the pendulum tipping to the left again so you can stall. And you can think that through yourself but what's going to happen with this particular example is the following. First of all you see I've moved to the left because I want to tip the pendulum slightly to the right. So there you are you see it's tipped slightly to the right. Now I can start moving to the right so that's what I've done I've moved to the right but unfortunately by the time I get to this right hand point here I'm still tipped right and what this means is because I've hit this end stop I can't actually get the pendulum fully upright or tipping slightly to the left so I can't stop it from continuing to fall. So if the arm is still moving to the right or leaning to the right when we hit the end stop the arm's going to fall over and we cannot stop it and the failure here is because my control law didn't know about this end stop it didn't take it into account when it planned my trajectory in order to stabilize this inverted pendulum. So this is another example of where disaster can happen because you have ignored the constraints in the system. So if the control law does not take the position of the end stop into account any strategy it proposes could be seriously flawed. Finally now we're going to look at some predictive control laws in the presence of constraints. So far the earlier chapters have ignored constraints. So what we're going to do now is compare the behavior you get out of a predictive control law when you include constraints in the decision making process as opposed to the case where you do not include them. So typical files we're going to look at video 5 underscore 1 example 1 which is in the GPC filter. Now the dotted lines are the result when there are no constraints included in your decision making process. So let's go and find the file. So here you look at video 5 example 1 so I can just press F5 to run that and you will get some figures and there you go and what you'll see is different responses depending upon whether you include the constraints in the decision making process or don't. Okay. There's also an example two. I'm just going to demonstrate. They run and then we'll go and discuss them. So there's example two which is slightly different and finally there's also an example three where the results are very very different but we'll go back to the PowerPoint to discuss these. The key thing is you can see where the files are. You can go and edit them and do what you want with them should you need to. Let's have a look then at first one, example one. Now in this case saturation control which is what happens when the control law proposes an input which is too large and you say well I'm going to simply move that down to the saturation value it could be quite effective in this particular case because saturation may be the best that you can do. So in this case what you get out of a proper predictive control which includes constraints in the decision making process and a saturation could well be the same. All right? And you'll see a similar result with example 2. 
Now, what we're going to do now is enforce saturation even where it's not included in the optimization. And what you've got here is a slightly different example. So here, the key constraint is actually on the rates delta u. And you can see that. You can see these lines here of constant gradient. And what that's telling you is that we've implemented a rate constraint on the input. And specifically here, what you'll notice is if you include the constraints in the decision-making process, you get this nice response. If you do not include the constraints in the decision-making process and you just use saturation, your response is nowhere near as good. You've got a significant deterioration in your behavior. So saturation control gives poor behavior. And here's the same example, but with some slightly different parameters. OK, sorry, not slightly different parameters, a different rate constraint. We've made the rate constraint a bit more severe. And here, you can see, ignoring the constraints in the decision-making process, your performance is really very poor indeed. So what's the summary? A failure to take proper account of constraints during a feedback design can have undesirable consequences. In the best case, you could just get suboptimal behavior. But in the worst case, you could break the system altogether or have very undesirable behavior. Even a simple saturation policy can come badly unstuck in some scenarios, although in other cases it may work fine. And the bottom line is there's a need to integrate constraints into the control design in a systematic fashion.